Hello, and welcome to the Let's Talk Moral Injury podcast. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Roberts. And I'm your co-host, Mia Ricks. Today, we have a special guest. We have Steve Alpert with us. Steve, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are very excited to meet you. And would you like to take a minute to kind of give our listeners a brief introduction of yourself? See if I can do 70 years in one minute. Uh, uh, born and raised in New York City. Um, I'm a fine art painter that paints uh, primarily um, a lot of uh, paintings that honor men and women who serve in uniform. Uh, it's a debt that I have to pay. I did not serve in uniform. Um, it was the time of Vietnam. When I left high school in 68. I had wanted to go to West Point, but um, I really didn't want to have anything to do with Vietnam at all. And uh, I became even more radical, radicalized after those poor kids were killed at Kent State. And uh, every time I go to the Vietnam Memorial Wall, I look at those names, I shed a tear, and I say the same three words, and for what? But um, I um, have a very strong uh, feeling for men and women who serve in uniform, because I know everybody has gone down to the local recruiting station and signed a piece of paper and made a pledge. and. Uh, really have no idea what is possible, what might happen after that. And so um, the stories of courage and, and service and steadfastness um, really impresses me. And I'm sorry I missed it. So I feel like uh, I'm paying back a debt as best I can at this time in my life. I've been making these kind of paintings since 2003. Um, I was a TV producer for 35 years. And I left it uh, about 21 years ago to become a fine art painter. And I kind of got uh, squeezed back into producing a, producing a documentary right now about social justice in the military, about a very fine gentleman uh, who is a, uh, an ER doctor and Lieutenant Colonel. He's now in the reserves, Kamal Kalsi, who uh, got a special accommodation to wear a turban and beard as he's a Sikh, uh, with a Sikh religion, and uh, uh, received a, a special accommodation, but that was not good enough for my friend Kamal. No, he had to go and get lawyers and volunteers. And eight years later, he got the army to reverse the rule. And now um, anyone can serve wearing articles of faith. That's because of the work of Kamal and uh, Kamal Kelsey. And the Air Force has followed suit. And now they're suing the Marines and the Navy. And eventually they will win. So um, I have a son, I have a granddaughter. I have a dog. I always have a dog and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I, I also have to have a dog. <laughs> I have two dogs currently and I, I love them to death. So every dog, every other dog we get, my wife says, so this is the last dog. <laughs> I say, I always say, I, sure. I'm, not, I'm not saying that. <laughs> it's never the last dog. No, I, I, you know, life is, life is not worth living for me without a dog. What can uh, I say? I agree completely with you. So I found it interesting. I was actually looking at your website and I saw a picture that caught my eye almost immediately. And it was of Angel, I believe her last name is Hughes. Uh, yes, Angel Hughes, of course. So I thought it was absolutely beautiful. The colors. Thank you. It was so warm and inviting. It was almost as though I looked at this image and I felt like I had known her my whole life. Wow, that's great. And it's just, I feel like you really captured and I don't even know this person. And I feel like she's a very friendly and welcoming face, but she also holds like so much power in her presence that it really, looking at this image, it's just, I want to stare at it for hours. It's just beautiful. And I think the great thing about it is your color choice. It completely, it, I'm trying to think of the word. It's the colors that you pick really go with her like skin tone. Like it helps like bring it out and bring like brightness and it brings like a feeling of warmth and happiness to the image that I really like while also staying strong and I just, I find it very interesting what you're doing and seeing the images that you have is just, that one caught my eye almost immediately. And it's just, it's incredible. 
you know, you know, it's so far. The great thing about art is that everybody has a different. Uh, everybody gets grabbed by something different, you know, and uh, and everybody has a different story that maybe even that I have in making the painting. Angel uh, was a Coast Guard aviator. She wanted to. She uh, Angel grew up uh, with immigrant parents from Haiti. Grew up in the New York area, New Jersey, and um, from the time she was eleven years old, she wanted to fly. She just had this thing. She 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 wanted to fly, and um, it turns out right across the street from I think her school, there was a flying club in high school, and she joined that flying club uh, club, and she learned to fly, and then she had to fight hard um, to actually become a, a Coast Guard aviator. And, um, you know, as a woman, it's always, it's always a little bit more difficult. This is what I learned in making this series of women portraits of, of, of women veterans. And Angel is exactly everything that you described, Mia. She is positive. She is warm. She's very powerful. She's a lovely, lovely person. And she insisted, she says, I'm going to wear my traps. I've got to wear my traps. Uh, so I said, okay. And uh, so we went, we went to lunch. I said, uh, uh, I said, what kind of food do you want? When you go out to lunch, you can get to know each other. And there's every kind of food in my neighborhood here in New York and the Upper West Side. So what what haven't you been able to get that we can get? And she goes, Indian food. I said, okay. So we went to a really nice Indian place. We had a nice conversation, came back to my uh, apartment and sat her down in the dining room. This was, I guess, in the fall, about guess, maybe two years ago, maybe three years ago when I was, started the series. And uh, she, you know, out of all the series, out of all the 12 paintings, only if I only have a few of the women smiling, I don't necessarily yeah. want to paint a portrait of, of somebody who's smiling. It's not like a, you know, it's not a photo op. Um, I, I, I'm looking for that Mona Lisa moment where you look at the image and you don't really know. And, and, and the person who looking at you off the canvas gives you a sense of that they know something that you don't. So there's some, some kind of mystery about some of the paintings like Don Halfacre, who was the very first one, uh, but but with Angel, there was no doubt. There was no way you... <laughs> she doesn't do that. She's she's about smiling, and the same thing with a woman named Arabia uh, Little John uh, uh, in the Navy. Uh, she flew all the way from San Diego with her husband just to have lunch and get her photo taken. Came in the middle of a, a nor'easter storm. It was horrible, um, and then we took a couple of photographs outside, and I love that painting of her. But uh, Angel is a very special, special woman. She's now flying for UPS and uh, she's retired out of the Coast Guard. And uh, when, when she went into the military, her, her um, idea was that she wanted to use her flying to save people. So that's what she did. She did uh, air um, and sea rescue work, mostly out of, um, she was mostly stationed out of Mobile, Alabama. So yeah, thank, I thank, it, thank, thank you for identifying that. Always so, so surprising. I find it very interesting that you said the part about the smiling because my parents are photographers and that's what they went to school for. Whenever they go out and they do like weddings and stuff or even like senior portraits and stuff, my mom always says, okay, do a couple smiling, but then also do some without. And that's what she said. And we were talking about it. And you're just like, it's a very timeless look when you're not smiling in a picture and it, right. just, it makes an image so much more powerful I think so too. because I, you know, you're trying to think what's going through their head. So for Dawn Halfacre, who started the whole series off, she was the first one and I didn't know I was going to do a whole series, but a, a mutual friend of ours said, uh, you, Dawn, you have to meet Steve and Steve, you have to meet Dawn. Uh, Dawn is a West Pointer and she uh, was deployed to Iraq as a captain at a, an MP station in Bakuba. And um, she was on patrol in the middle of three Humvees and an RPG came in and took off the arm of the fellow sitting in front of her and then took her arm off as well. And the last thing she remembers before passing out was being whisked away in a Black Hawk. And uh, they put her in a, uh, in a coma while they did surgery in, in Iraq and they flew her to Germany where more surgery and then they flew her to um, Walter Reed, where she was taken out of the coma and her father was standing there and said, you know, honey, they took, they took your arm. And she'd been a basketball player. If she had gone to a regular college, it would have been a scholarship. 
uh, basketball player. She was a very, very talented athlete, talented athlete. And um, I, so we met for lunch, not knowing very much about her really, other than telling that story. And she was absolutely lovely and she was funny and she was irreverent and she was sensitive and she was brilliant. Um, Dawn has since, uh, she started a business that she sold uh, last summer for uh, a mountain of money. She was very, very successful. She's absolutely brilliant. And she, she built a business. Every time I would see her, well, Dawn, how many employees do you have now? Oh, I got 300. A couple of months later, I see her, how many now? Oh, we're up to like 450, 500. She's a very brilliant and like, like laser focus type, type person. She has two boys. And uh, so she, uh, I thought to myself, this is the beginning. I said, how am I going to photograph Dawn? I don't really, maybe we'll meet in the park, bring the boys. I, I, I manufactured all this, all this content in my mind. But about the third time we had lunch, as we were getting up from the lunch booth, I said, I pulled out my, my, my cell phone and I said, Dawn, let me just take a couple of shots. Now, Dawn is not somebody who really wants her photograph taken. There's some people who love the camera. I don't think Dawn loves the camera that much. She doesn't like necessarily call attention to herself. I took seven shots as we were just getting up from the table. I looked at them really, really quick. And the fifth one, was exactly what I was looking for. I said, I got it. So I worked from that. It took me three months. I, this was the beginning. I, I, I was just new to portraiture and um, I really struggled uh, until I really got it. But once I got it, um, I felt that I could see, I could, I, I could see her whole life story in, in her gaze. I could see the tragedy. I, I could see her triumph, her comeback. I could see her intelligence. I could see her her um, sensitivity and making that first portrait of Don Hefaker really taught me a great deal about um, what the job is. In, in you know, I want to tell that person's whole life story in that little millisecond that the camera. Um, I, I don't. I don't have people sit for me. That's a. Some artists like to do that. That's that's not my thing. So it sounds like um, with these the folks um you really take some time to get to know them as a person it's as not much as just... I can. yes yes so 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 your take so with don you mentioned three months is that is that typical that you're meeting oh. with them many times and or is it mm -hmm. a, a one time you said how how does it go um <laughs> i try to have as much control of the situation as i can but like I, I don't, I don't have much control at all. Uh, with Dawn, it took three months because I dedicated an entire summer to that portrait because I, I knew that I was up against a steep learning curve for me. But as time went on, um, uh, Kirsty Ennis, who former Marine, who was in a horrible helicopter accident. I mean, the thing fell out of the sky from the last 150 feet, just like smack down. Everybody was uh, severely wounded and she was in really bad shape. She lost a leg below the knee. She had, her head was all scarred. I mean, she went through a lot. And um, I only had maybe a half an hour with her in a, uh, she was in a hotel downtown, she was going to be going to Philadelphia the next day. She had spoken, uh, she had a speaking engagement that afternoon. Uh, she had to meet somebody for dinner. She only had a half an hour for me. So we meet in this lounge at like four o'clock. It was November. It was dark outside. It was dark. In the, and the photographs I got, I, I was not very happy with those photographs. And I got, I got a pretty good sense of her uh, from that. But the reason I bring her up is because I had such a short amount of time um with with Kirsty. now with someone like um uh nicole malakowski who was a very celebrated f-16 pilot she was the uh she was a commander of the thunderbirds um and an extraordinary extraordinary person who does public speaking i met her up in white plains new york at a hotel where she was staying because she was speaking at a lar large conference of insurance people um, she does inspirational speaking. She's brilliant. And um, 
had a, had a wonderful time with her. We spent about an hour, 15 minutes at lunch. And then we went outside and I took some photographs and um, it, it just sort of was easy. Also a woman named Miyako, Miyoko, um, this, is, this is a gal um, who um, in Des Moines, Iowa, joined the National Guard just to pay for college really. And then, you know, the buildings were bombed and then she got deployed and she, uh, Miyoko, was a, she's a little, little person who uh, was assigned to drive these monster transport trucks. And they would go through unprotected desert at night in these long convoys. I mean, that's hair raising stuff. She, but yeah. the great thing about Miyoko is that she wrote a book called All I Could Ever Be. And it's a wonderful book. So I got a really good insight. And I had a very short amount of time when I met her in DC. She was in for a conference. We had breakfast barely. I had maybe, again, maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes with her. But because of the book gave me a lot of insight to who she was. A very courageous, um, resilient uh, uh, young woman. So I, I, you know, I had various experiences with all of my, I, you know, the, 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 the most astounding story really was the very last one. Now, my project director, Navy, Naval aviator, Linda Maloney, who I, I was introduced to once I started making these paintings and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do, came up with the idea called Proudly She Served. Um, and I said to be, I said that we, we landed on having a dozen paintings even number of 12. And we have um, a good sense of diversity in that, in that 12. And I said, to, I said to Linda, we have to have a wasp. You're all familiar with, with the wasp, the, the um, women air service pilots from World War II. Uh, there were so many, uh, there was a shortage of, of, of men pilots. And so um, I think they got, they get 3,000 volunteer women. I was reading it the other day and I don't remember, was it 30,000 or 3,000? I think it was 3,000. And um, so the army said, we will give you flight lessons. We will teach you how to fly. We will give you room and board and uniforms. And what you'll be doing is taking the aircraft, brand new aircraft out of the manufacturer, test the aircraft and then deliver the aircraft to wherever it, wherever it needs to go. Everything from P-51 Mustangs to B-17 Flying Fortresses and, and B-20, B-24s as well, I think. So, um, I mean, these women did amazing, amazing service. If uh, 38, uh, they, uh, they wound up with 1,200 active wasps. 38 were killed during the war, doing their service. And when, when one of them got killed, they had to take a, a, a collection to send the dead body home. The army would not pay for it. And when the war was over, they were not given veteran status until somewhere in, in, in the Clinton administration. It took all that time. Wow. Wow, that's right. If you want to get angry, that's a good thing to get angry about. So <laughs> that's right. I said to Linda, I said, we have to have a wasp. So, uh, so we came up with a woman named B. Haydu from New Jersey originally. Uh, she learned. She knew how to fly before she went in. She became one of the one of the main leaders of, uh, of the wasps. And uh, at the time, she was ninety nine years old. This was a year ago, just about a year ago. She was ninety nine years old. Um, couldn't see her. COVID, and she was in a also in a in a nursing home. I think she was not not particularly well at that time at ninety nine. And uh, her daughter sent us a, a photo of her, a, a bunch of photos, and I chose one. And she was wearing her uniform. She looked like, I think the photo had been taken maybe within the last 10 years. So she was definitely in her senior, senior time. And uh, I love the photo. And um, I started making the painting and she turned 100. So the painting is on my easel in the studio here in New York. And when I'm painting a portrait of somebody, I'm thinking about that person everything I know about that person. And B had written a book. I had, I had read uh, a, a, much of the book uh, and talked to Diana about who she was in life. But I assigned B, in my mind, B was down in Florida. I'm in New York, but B was down in Florida, just as a point of reference. 
and um, she turned 100. And then towards the end of January, I was about three weeks into the two and a half, three weeks into the painting. And I got a call from uh, a text from Nicole Malakowski. Both of them are in the Women Aviators Hall of Fame in DC. And so they're, they've been friends for many years and they both had won the, uh, been awarded the Medal of Freedom. Is that possible? I think so. And um, Nicole told me that B had passed. So here, here at the end of three years of making 12 portraits and B is the last one and she passes away while the canvas is still on the easel. She's no longer in Florida in my mind because she's gone. And, but, and this is gonna sound really crazy, but I'm just gonna say it. I felt her presence in the studio for about three or four days. Sure. That's, all I can, that's all I can say. And um, I finished the painting. And when I heard that she had passed, the painting completely changed for me. My perception of, of the painting I was making changed. I can't really put my finger on exactly how, but it was different. And in the, when I finished, I was finished with the painting, but I, I, I wanted one little last touch in the upper right, right hand corner, there's a little, little, little air, airplane flying away. And that, and for me, that was B going off to her next destination. And yeah, so I sent the, yeah, <laughs> it was really, <laughs> I, see that. Um, I mean, I, I put her in a, uh, the background was a, a, an old air, an air, airstrip. Yeah. I found a windsock from that era, an orange striped windsock that they uh, used to employ. And I sent the photo of the, of the final to Diana, the daughter. And she wrote me an email and just, I got goosebumps. She says to me, you know, I'm so glad you got to spend time with my mom. That's beautiful. How did she, how did she know? How did she know? <laughs> and if, if, I, if, I, if I had to pick one one painting that that means the most to me, it would it would be the it would be B. I mean Dawn too because Dawn was the first, but what a what a way to finish three years of mm. you know of work like that. Right. It was absolutely wonderful. I'm glad that you brought up Dawn because that was the other painting that caught my eyes. Oh, tell me. <laughs> I just. Everything that you described here as is what I saw of her in that painting. And wow. going back to earlier, what I was trying to think of is that um, the colors that you choose, it complements their complexions. Every one of your images, I can tell it, everything in the image based on the colors, it complements them so well. And it's just the green in that image. It just oh, yeah, I love that green. To me, the green, I think, pulled together that entire image. And when I think of green, I think of very, like, peaceful serenity in that color. And that's kind of how I saw her as a very, like, peaceful person. But then I also liked how in the image it was darker, I believe, in the left-hand corner. And then it got to the white in the top right. And it was just the contrast in it was absolutely stunning. Thank and you. It was very powerful, but also it was almost like she had this angelic um, like light cast upon her. And yes. the way you're describing her, I just feel as though it fit the image almost perfectly. Well, thank you so much. You know, the green was a choice. She was not wearing a green sweater on the day. I don't remember what, she was wearing a light colored sweater, mm -hmm. but it, 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 wouldn't, it, would, it wouldn't have popped. And I, and you know, she's a fiery redhead. So the green goes really, really well. And uh, that particular green, I, I, I love that green. And the darkness is obviously, you know, the tragedy of her losing her arm. And if you look at that painting, you see her shoulder is, stops here. And I just put a little, little bit of a line of light, you know, for the, just, just to call attention to it in a, in a very subtle, subtle way. Like if people know her, they would, they would recognize that. But I, um, because I spent so much time on that painting, because I was learning how to do portraits, really, basically at that time, and, and with Dawn as a, as, a, as a teaching tool for me, uh, I really struggled with what the background should be. And I have a, um, I share, I share a, a studio with a couple of other artists in New York here. Uh, I have a second home. I have my own studio with no other artists in there. Um, and... Um, I was really struggling with what, what, I, what I should do with the background. 
and one of my uh, one of my buddies said, "Well, ask the painting what it wants to be." So um, that took some thinking, and I thought about it. And I thought about it, and I said, "Well, I think it wants to be dark on the left. And I think it wants to go from the dark to the light because that's what Dawn has done in her life." So it's kind of a metaphorical thing that you you picked up obviously Mia so that's really nice thank you that's what it made me think of is that she might have had a darker past and she was going towards a brighter future or it could have been because left to right is usually how you read so right, right. you're reading her dark past going into that bright future but then I also wondered um was there something that was great in her life and then she might have lost it and kind of like what you were saying yeah. like with your arm that's perfect kind of like, you're telling me the story i just kept thinking about all of it and i'm wondering yeah he did this on purpose <laughs> or am i just <laughs> overthinking it <laughs> no you're right on the money and you know she was a, a ball player and she was a right she was a righty mm -hmm. she lost her right arm that's yeah i, I had I had this uh, remarkable moment with dawn the second time i met her i went to her office we were going to meet in a conference room and her uh, assistant brought me a, a little bottle of water and I was sitting at the, at the conference table. And then Dawn comes in carrying a bunch of stuff with her uh, left arm and, and a bottle of water. She puts the bottle of water down and she says, Steve, could you please open that for me? And I was like, oh yeah, of course. It never even occurred to me because of how she has, um, how she comports herself. You, you, you don't really notice that she, is missing an arm so i thought to myself yeah how, how on earth would she open up a, the top of a bottle with, with with just one hand it was just it was just a, a crazy moment of realization um i'm not really sure what it means but it was a it was a it was kind of a poignant moment between the two of us in, in, in that you know a little thing like that and we laughed about it later certainly um but she's one of them you know, extraordinary person so there's a two-part question for you what is what is the most valuable uh what is most valuable to you about doing this work and what do you think um is most valuable for the women that you paint um how, how does it how does it bring value to them how do they feel about it uh okay i'll ask the answer the first question first uh, what does it mean for me it um you know, in making all these military paintings, uh, most all artists pretty much work alone. I'm a uh, I'm a very social person, but I have a part of me that needs to spend time alone. Maybe it's part of being an only child. I noticed that my son is an only child, and when when life gets complicated enough, he needs to take some time on his own. So, um, I, I guess I always did that as a kid even though I was gregarious and I was an athlete and musician and did, you know, took part in a lot of, a lot of stuff. I have a lot, a lot of friends. Um, these paintings mean to me first, the first thing I noticed in the beginning was that it, it bring, they're my ambassadors and, and they introduce me, they bring me into the world. I, I feel like I, I can participate in, in society with these paintings takes me out of the studio. It's a lot of artists who can make great work, but then what do you do with all that stuff? Used to be that um, it was all about galleries, but the internet has changed all of that and has made every artist uh, potentially their own best entrepreneur. So as a TV producer for all those years, I was never afraid to you know, float an idea or make a phone call and try to get things going. You know, as a TV producer, you start with an idea and then you gather a team and then you try to get the money. It's, and I produced three, three stage plays, one Broadway show and two off, two off Broadway shows. And that's the same thing. You start with, a, excuse me, a kernel of an idea and then you try to bring it into the world. So these paintings bring me into the world in a profound way. And, and it gives me an opportunity also to pay off that debt of service that I that I didn't wear that uniform back uh, when I was of, when I was of age to do that, so um, it provides an opportunity for me to pay back that debt. And that's a very uh, that's a very very personal thing. Um, and like I say, I, I feel that very 
uh, in, in a very acute way when I go to the Vietnam Memorial Wall and I see all those names and, you know, I invariably tear up. And then I say the same thing, like I said before, the same thing, and for what? Right. Um, on that particular situation. Right. Anyway, um, the second part of the question uh, for the women, I think it's different for all of them. I can't really answer for any of them except for the fact that they feel tremendously honored that they've been picked out to be part of this project. Uh, this project was just made up between Linda Maloney and myself. Uh, she's the project director. She bestowed upon me executive director. But the truth of the matter is there would just be a bunch of paintings. And you know, without Linda, um, all the things that are happening for this project now um, would not probably would not be happening as quickly anyway. We've been at this for three years and there's talk about a, a, an exhibition at the Library of Congress next year. Um, we're talking to some people at the Smithsonian. There's a lot of a lot of potential for the seri series now. We're, we're teaming with the VA now also uh, with a wonderful woman named Liz Estabrooks uh, at, at the VA headquarters on, on Vermont Avenue in, in DC. And uh, we're gonna, she, she produced, created a series of, uh, of beautiful photographs of women veterans all over the country. She started in, in Oregon, where this is her home state. And um, she, she, when, if she, when, when Liz, who's an army veteran, she started going around the state of Oregon talking to a lot of women veterans. And they all said, many of them said the same thing that they didn't really, they didn't really value their service. They felt invisible. A lot of different women said this very impressed Liz. And then Liz said, you know what, we got to do a, uh, I got to do something about this. So, so she hired a photographer, I guess, I think he worked for the VA. I think he worked for the VA. And he, he took magnificent photographs of these women with a gray black drop, uh, a gray backdrop, really great photographs, black and white. And uh, the project is called I Am Not Invisible. Um, she had a, uh, uh, an exhibition in Salem, Oregon, which is the state capital. And she got one of the senators to come who was knocked out. And he said, you know what? Every senator has to see this. So they actually had, a, had an exhibition in the rotunda in the Russell Senate building, which was absolutely fabulous. So uh, Liz and, and us and Linda and I are gonna team up together and do a, a mutual exhibition with some of the I'm Not Invisible photographs and, and the, the 12 paintings that we have. So I, mean, I don't know if that answers your question, Dan, but you know, I think every, every woman, um, they all feel very honored to be part of this. Um, we communicate with them fairly often, let them know where, where we're at. And they all, they all are very, very, um, they're all very pleased to, to, to be with us. They feel, um, I think it makes them feel special, which is which is great because they are. And I'm sorry I can't do twelve thousand of them, but right, you know. Well, that concludes the session for this week of Let's Talk Moral Injury. I'm Dr. Daniel Roberts, and I am Mia Rick. Women chaplains, we need you. The Tubman Chaplain Network offers women chaplains an opportunity to serve and support military service women and veterans who do not have access to a chaplain that they trust. Tubman Chaplain Network's chaplains serve as volunteers and do not charge fees for their services. They must be able to respond to a request for support within 48 hours from the time a woman veteran contacts the network. Serving as a TCN chaplain offers a number of benefits, including liability insurance, annual training, and ministry experience. To learn more about the network and how to apply, go to chaplainconsultants.com forward slash Tubman dash chaplain dash network. Use passcode 34663965 or contact Dr. Daniel Roberts at droberts at chaplainconsultants.com. That's chaplainconsultants.com slash Tubman dash chaplain dash network passcode 34663965 or to make it easy, just contact Dr. Daniel Roberts, D. Roberts at chaplainconsultants.com.